Hello again, everybody. We're going to be talking here about managing the patient with HIV. HIV is so commonly tested on the exam, um, so you really, really, really need to know at least the basics. And we're going to cover a good amount here. We're going to cover um, not only how we diagnose this and how we screen it and how uh, we treat it, but also we're going to talk a little bit about prophylaxis. We're not going to talk about pre-exposure prophylaxis here. This is an important topic and I'm going to give it its own talk. Um, so uh, here we're going to be talking about diagnosis, uh, we're going to talk about medications, and then we'll talk about post-exposure prophylaxis. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or in the i button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos, and I thank all those of you who have already stepped up to donate. I very much appreciate it. And you can also subscribe to my channel and you'll get updates as I put more and more videos up. Okay, so just a little bit of epidemiology because if epidemiology is going to be tested anywhere on the exam, you can expect it to be tested here. Um, so you can see that the hotbed as far as HIV prevalence is in sub-Saharan Africa. However, we see other hotbeds in Southeast Asia, as well as in the United States and in Russia. So it is certainly not just a disease of uh, developing countries. We see it in developed countries as well, but the epidemiology is a little bit different as we're going to see. Now, looking specifically in the United States, we see increased prevalence along the coasts. So particularly in the south, along the Bible Belt, we see increased prevalence in Florida. Um, and then we also see some prevalence on the west coast. Now, another uh, way that you can see this is if you have some idea of counties in the United States. Um, so you see it in Cook County, where Chicago is, in Hennepin County, where Minneapolis is. Uh, you see it in Vegas, you see it in Kansas City and in St. Louis. So urban areas are going to have a higher prevalence. We also see slightly higher prevalence on native reservations. So this here is Menominee County, not a big city. It's a native reservation. Uh, we also see a little bit increased prevalence here in the Rosebud Reservation. Um, this is the Pine Ridge Reservation here. And then... Uh, this one, I believe, is uh, Fort Berthold. So um, if you're familiar with, uh, with native reservations, you'll see that there is an increased uh, prevalence there as well. Now, as far as incident cases by race and ethnicity, we see an increased burden on blacks and African Americans as well as Latinos. It's a disproportionate amount of cases in these patients. 70% are in blacks and Latinos. As far as transmission modes in the United States, uh, two-thirds are going to be male-male sexual contact. Now, is it because male-male sexual contact is inherently dangerous? No, it's because you're more likely to get HIV from a penis than from a vagina. So, you know, heterosexual women are at increased risk and uh, men who have sex with men are at increased risk. So it has nothing to do with sexual orientation. It has everything to do with the genitals involved. As you can see here, in India, uh, we see 87.4% of cases are from heterosexual contact, whereas only about 1% of cases are from uh, MSM contact. And then worldwide, again, we see that this is primarily a disease of heterosexual contact. Um, fewer than 1% of cases worldwide are spread through uh, MSM. Some basics about HIV transmission, you can look this up as you wish. This is kind of step one stuff, but know that the HIV is a retrovirus and it uh, infects CD4 cells. Remember that CD4 cells are T cell. T cells are responsible for helping you fight off atypical bacteria, fungi, and parasites. And as we look at the opportunistic infections, we'll see that atypical bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites um, are the ones that are causing this. We don't see so much problems with, you know, Staph aureus and stuff like that. Um, so one of the most important enzymes, if not the most important enzymes in HIV is reverse transcriptase. HIV is an RNA virus, but what happens is the RNA is reverse transcribed to DNA, which then integrates into the CD4 genome. The natural progression is seven to 10 years from HIV to AIDS. So if we don't treat HIV at all, you just have somebody who gets HIV, it takes about seven to 10 years for them to have AIDS and ultimately die. This is what we saw in the 1980s. It was a death sentence. Today, absolutely not. 
We give them antiretrovirals. For the most part, they'll live a normal lifespan. Uh, prognosis is based on the CD4 count, and that's approximate prognosis, so we can get the CD4 count up with antiretroviral therapy, but that's t that tells you how endangered the patient is at the moment. Infectivity is based on viral load. So if you're asking, if you're an HIV patient, you're asking, what's the risk of getting my partner uh, infected with HIV? That's going to be based on the viral load. Now, who should get tested? Um, really just use your common sense. People who are at high risk. So unprotected sex, IV drug use, anyone who's recently got diagnosed with an STD. Pregnant women, we use opt-out screening. So all pregnant women, unless they ask not to be tested, will get tested for HIV. People with symptoms consistent with acute HIV syndrome, we'll go into that. And then anyone who feels they may have been exposed and there's a realistic possibility. Um, so really it's use your clinical judgment. The best initial test is a combined antigen antibody immunoassay. It used to be we started with ELISA and then went to Western blot. We do it a little differently now. So uh, the best initial test is the HIV-1, HIV-2 antigen antibody combined immunoassay. That's a mouthful, but that's the first test we do. That's the screening test. If they come back positive on that, then we do a differentiation assay where we're looking for HIV-1 and HIV-2 specific uh, markers. This is the algorithm here. This is the natural progression. What I want to point out here is here in red, we see viral load, and here in blue, we see CD4 count. Notice that immediately we have a very big spike in viral load, and then you mount an immune response, and then the viral load is going to drop, but persistently throughout this latent period where you don't have symptoms, you're gonna have a progressive drop in your CD4 count. And then ultimately you'd start dropping below 200 and this is where you begin to get opportunistic infections. So the goal is to start somewhere in here and start antiretroviral therapy. So their CD4 count maybe does something like this and their viral load count does something like that. How does it present? It can, it can present in the acute seroconversion period, that's right here, uh, where they can get a flu-like syndrome. It could occur during the asymptomatic period of clinical latency, that would be right here, where they're not going to have any symptoms. Uh, in that case, it's usually detected as a screen. Uh, it can occur during the symptomatic period of immune dysregulation, or it could be detected during AIDS. The acute HIV syndrome is uh, kind of an enigma to diagnose, so it looks a lot like the flu or like mono. Some patients don't even get tested because they just think they have the flu and I don't need to go to the doctor. Symptoms, it looks like the flu, it looks like mono, it's almost identical. So if you got a young man coming in who maybe he's a, a gay man and he's coming in um, with the flu, um, Always important to have your sexual history because it's important to know that he's at higher risk. Um, and if he runs a negative flu test, negative mono test, you should definitely get an HIV test. He will test positive because this is a period in which the HIV viral load count is going to be very high. Um, the best initial test, as usual, the antigen antibody immunoassay. If he's positive, get the confirmatory test and then treat him accordingly. And I say him because, like I said, in the United States, 67% of cases or thereabouts uh, are in MSM. The treatment. So we do a battery of baseline tests that includes genotyping, a CD4 count, viral load. All of this is once you have a, a positive diagnosis. So these are HIV positive people. CD4 count, viral load, for reasons I already talked about, viral sensitivity testing, which will direct treatment. We want to test for any of the opportunistic pathogens and possible other STDs. So test for TB, CMV, other STDs, toxoplasma. In women, you want to get a pap smear. Increased risk of cervical cancer with uh, HIV. And then you'll do routine labs. Uh, make sure you get lipids and a pregnancy test. That's, again, baseline, but also to monitor for adverse effects of treatment. And then ophthalmologic exam is baseline. You'll follow these patients up every three to six months. I do want to stress here, especially for you older doctors, that we begin antiretroviral therapy upon diagnosis. We used to wait until the CD4 count dropped below 350, which, of course, was inevitable. We do not do that anymore. We, we start treatment immediately. 
And this is a change since 2015. Antiretroviral therapy is the mainstay of therapy in HIV. We started immediately, but before starting, we should get a viral sensitivity test, which will help dictate therapy. Three classes of antiretrovirals are most commonly used. Those are the NRTIs, uh, the NNRTIs, I sh actually I should say four, um, and then uh, the protease inhibitors and integrase inhibitors. Typically, our regimen is gonna be two NRTIs and an integrase inhibitor. So the NRTIs, um, the common adverse effect with any of these is the possibility of lactic acidosis. However, these different drugs, they have some different side effects, and it's important you know them. Important to know zidovudine, because it's commonly given, can cause myelosuppression. So we want to follow up with CBC. A back of ear can cause a rash, and this is an important one because if we're going to give a back of ear, we need to test their HLA B5701 genotype um, because if that's abnormal, they can get this rash. Uh, another one is tenofovir. Why? Because this is commonly used as part of a PrEP regimen, which is pre exposure prophylaxis, can cause bone demineralization. Didanosine, stavudine, and zalcitabine can also cause pancreatitis. The NNRTIs are not commonly given anymore. The big one, though, is Afavirenz. Afavirenz can cause psychiatric disturbances. It used to be contraindicated during pregnancy, but now we can give it after eight weeks. And most women, they don't know they're pregnant until around that period. Hint, hint, Republicans who want to ban abortion. Protease inhibitors, uh, they all end in NAVIR. Um, so one of the big adverse effects here is lipo redistribution, lipodystrophy. We can see this in any of the antiretrovirals, but we especially see it in protease inhibitors. Integrase inhibitors are commonly given now. Um, they block the integration of HIV genome into the host genome. They all end in Tegravir. Think of the Tegra in integrase and vir for virus. Uh, Raltegravir and Dalutegravir are the two probably most commonly given. Dalutegravir is not given in pregnancy. Then there are a few other drugs um, that you may see thrown around. This is lipodystrophy. So lipodystrophy or liporedistribution uh, occurs with antiretroviral therapy. How do you know it's happening? Well, you got a patient who's not overweight, not obese, but has this truncal obesity. So look at this guy. If you look at him from the neck up, he is not an overweight man. Okay, overweight, they'd have pudgy cheeks, double chin, you know, what you would expect to see in an overweight person. But you see this guy, he's got thin arms, thin legs, but he's got this truncal, what appears to be truncal obesity. That's lipo redistribution, super common in HIV, and it's fairly harmless. So as I mentioned, the regimen, two NRTIs and integrase inhibitors, the most common regimen, we would call that an NRTI backbone, where we give two drugs and then an integrase inhibitor. A very common regimen would be tenofovir and emtricitabine, which is given in one pill, and then dalutegravir. This combination therapy is also called HART, highly active antiretroviral therapy. You may also see just ART. The goal is to cut the viral load in half in the first month, ultimately getting them below 200 copies per mil. But the ultimate goal is to get them to undetectable. Um, we want to monitor for HIV metabolic syndrome, so we're getting lipid panels regularly. That's important to know. As far as HIV and pregnancy, all HIV positive women should be on heart just like everyone else. If her viral load count um, before she gives birth is a, a thousand or more, then she's got to get a C-section. And then before the C-section, we're going to start IV zidovudine. If her viral load is less than a thousand, then she can do vaginal delivery if she wants. Um, and that's provided there's no OB contraindications as usual. As far as the baby, uh, if the mom was on heart, uh, then we give zidovudine for four weeks after birth. Uh, if mom was not on heart, then we give zidovudine for six weeks, or some sources recommend a triple therapy um, for six weeks. And that would be your typical drugs that you would give for an HIV-positive patient with heart. So two NRTIs and an integrase inhibitor. And then you'll want to check this baby up again at two weeks, one to two months, and four to six months. And we're checking the HIV viral load. Why? Because antibodies are going to be positive no matter what, because those antibodies cross the placenta. Breastfeeding is generally contraindicated in uh, for HIV positive mothers. 
Post-exposure prophylaxis, again, use common sense. Sexual exposure to somebody who's HIV positive or unknown status, uh, if they've been sharing uh, e injection equipment, if there's a needle stick that's commonly asked, um, that's going to be done if you have a patient who's HIV positive and detectable or HIV positive and you don't know their viral load. Um, you can also consider it in sexual assault. The common regimen, again here, two NRTIs and an integrase inhibitor. So tenofovirum, tricitabine, and dolutegravir. You want to start this within three days of exposure and continue it for four weeks. At three days, HIV test before therapy. And at four weeks, HIV test. Okay. So to recap, best initial test is the combined antigen antibody immunoassay. If that's positive, get a differentiation assay. Most of those patients do have HIV. However, the most accurate test is a Western blot. Who do we screen? We screen at risk groups. Um, and we, um, again, we're going to be doing this uh, antigen antibody immunoassay as part of the screening. Antiretroviral therapy is for everybody who's HIV positive, typically two NRTIs and an integrase inhibitor. Know your side effects for each of your medications. So lipodystrophy is, can be seen with any of them, but most commonly the protease inhibitors, rash with the back of ears, psych disturbance with psych disturbances with efavirenz and so forth. Acute HIV syndrome looks like the flu and lymphadenopathy, often confused with mono. Consider this if you've got a young man coming in with the flu who tests negative for flu and mono. Interpartum management is based on viral load. So under 1,000, you're going to do C-section and interpartum zidovudine. Uh, breastfeeding is generally contraindicated for HIV-positive mothers. Pet prophylaxis is similar to general heart management with the triple therapy. Test them for HIV immediately and at four weeks, at which point you can discontinue therapy if they do test negative.